Hi everyone. So we last week uh, looked at chapters eight and nine of Ecclesiastes and kind of saw the limits of wisdom. Well, uh, Ecclesiastes espouses wisdom. It does not believe it is the way fully to live, purely as a pursuit. Okay, so and we saw wisdom helps you survive in front of a fearful king. Um, in the abuse of power can soften your face and wisdom can help save a city but nobody will thank you uh, as we saw in the last story in, in chapter 9. And so curiously, um, and, but we should expect it uh, from the teacher of Ecclesiastes, curiously he now does a whole uh, chapter and a half of Proverbs and enters the world of, of wisdom and we should know basically from what we, we expect of our, our coach, teacher, is that he won't play with a straight bat. He is he's being a little bit naughty um, in terms of presenting wisdom as basically a way to survive um, chaos and carnage that he is experiencing. The more I've read Ecclesiastes, the more uh, I think it's it's a late book that that's experienced Kings coming and going, um, a lot of evil monarchs. The the Northern Kingdom had so many evil kings, and, and well, all of them were. And uh, the, the Southern Kingdom didn't do a lot better. They had half a dozen good ones. So he's had to navigate, as the prophets have, how do you live in chaos? And so his wisdom is a little bit different. So if we look at Psalm 1, the clarity of the wisdom literature is this, that if you do good, good will follow you. And so like, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, take the path of sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. They yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. And all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff the wind drives away. I won't read it all, but Psalm 1 is highlighting two elements of the, of, of the wise life. Um, one, that the people who do good, who are righteous, are deeply rooted in the word of God and live out of the life of God. And so their leaves never wither. And they're always producing fruit. And that is a generally true statement, but there are exceptions, and that's where Ecclesiastes places itself in the world of exceptions. And but what's really interesting is the way the way it describes the the way of the wicked, which is you know follow the advice of the wicked, take paths, sinners tread, sit in the seat of scoffers, chaff is blown away by the wind. Um, the life of folly or wickedness is shown as a life of movement and and it's not rooted down like the way of the righteous is in the word of god it's rooted in nothing and other than talk other than scoffing uh, and and i think this is the zone in which uh, the writer of ecclesiastes is really interested to play out um so i'll read the uh, first few verses of of Ecclesiastes, and I want to break it into four sections. The first section is verse one to six, which is talking about folly, and then the response follows. Then there's another section on folly, and then the response follows. So really, he's he, I think he's more focused on folly than wisdom, although most of the commentators say this is a, a wisdom advice. I think this is how to deal with folly advice, uh, foolishness. And um, so, verse one to six, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give a foul odour, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honour. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, and the heart of the fool to the left. Even when fools walk on the road, they lack sense to show everyone that they are fools. And if the anger of a ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for calmness will undo great offences. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as great an e error as if proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I've seen slaves on horseback, 
and princes walk, walking on foot, foot like slaves. Now, interestingly, we probably quite like the idea of slaves being on horseback and the rich not getting their, their uh, just desserts, as he, he seems to say, but I'll come back to that one. The first verse is um, interesting. Um, it's, it's, a tr it's a tricky little proverb, but what, what it's saying in essence is that dead flies, or probably what it is interested in is his dead bodies, um, eventually overpower the ointment. You know, it, I think the picture here is of, of bodies being embalmed, that you, know, you can put all this ointment but eventually this fouler odor comes out because of this, the stench of death. And then he goes on to say, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The literal reading of that is more precious than wisdom and honor is a little folly. When you think about it, wisdom and honor are two big rocks in life. And what he's saying is, um, a little folly totally outweighs the, these big rocks of, of wisdom and honor. Now, in life, you, you see a person live really, really well, and then they do a, a, a dumb thing, and that na names the rest of their life, pretty much. And, and what he's saying here is, is something that's quite true, that all you need is one dead fly, and nobody wants to touch the ointment. It's... Um, it's not great. So that's, that's the first um, parable, and, it, and it's highlighting how much folly screws up everything. Just one bad decision can completely change everything. And then he goes on to say that the heart of the right, wise goes right, which is that the right side is favor and grace. So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So he's in the place of grace and favor. But the, the full verse to the left, which is the hand of judgment. Uh, so he's got this indiscernible r radar that chooses the less good, less valuable, less wise course without even trying. And unfortunately, I have known people like this who just have this great ability to self-sabotage without trying. Verse 3 is, um, is curious. Like Basically, it's saying... Even when a fool walks along the road, you can tell they're a fool. Basically, everything they do, do is, is characterized by some level of idiocy. So it, I don't think it's about how they walk. It's about how they posture themselves and how, how they approach things. That you, oh, this person lacks wisdom. And you've probably seen it in workplace environments or maybe even churches. And then, then he just gives what is a straight piece of, piece of wisdom advice to surviving with a bad king, which is if, if they get angry with you, don't do a runner. Stay in your place. Stay calm. And this is advice to people in high-level volatility. Just keep your head down and make right choices. I think we're in the zone of this powerful king at the start of chapter 8 who but you, you have to manage how you look and what you do to avoid um, uh, being damaged by the, the power that they wield. So, so we come to this reference to the kings, and I think it's no surprise this happens twice in the passage, two significant uh, references to kings, because kings were a big issue at this time period, if it's a late reading. And basically it's saying, I've seen evil, that kings appoint slaves and, um, and uh, princes walk around on foot like slaves, you know. And so when we read this, we think, ah, oh, finally, equality. But actually, this is not what this is. It's what he's saying here is people who, without any training, are being put in places um, that they have no right to have because they need not be prepared for governance they've got no experience so um we see this often in um 
countries where family is more important to have around you than anything else. So um, people appoint their families into big, these big positions and often it's um, a, a tyrannous type leader that does this. And as a result, the competency, they, they, they support financially all those people who are the yes people. Um, they, um, they want people around them who owe them. And I think this is what it's saying. If you put people into your administration who completely owe their loyalty to you and can't say, actually, I don't think this is a good decision, if they're just the yes people, then um, woe to the kingdom that there aren't enough strong voices around the king. I have noticed that our politicians have a, have a, new, a new habit. It's been going on for a couple of years, but it used to be that you'd look at a politician and um, they'd be interviewed and you would listen to them and you would be able to engage with them. But now they have a lineup behind them. They have a lineup of people nodding all the time. <laughs> now these people owe their appointments to the leader because they're, they're the ones who obviously in cabinet in a circle. But it's just very curious how the, the media demonstration of power now is to have a lot of nodding people behind you. Um, and this is what it's against. We don't want a whole lot of yes people surrounding our leader. We need to have strong voices. The height of folly is to appoint weak leaders. But to be honest, it seems too common. Um, too, too much the world that we're in as well. And so we come to, to the, the teacher's response. to So how do we deal with this stuff? The folly of the stink of tomfoolery, the... Um, the, the randomness of anger and, and bad appointments by governments that basically repay their mates. Um, and so he, he, he gives some advice, which is curious advice and seems unrelated. And most commentators seem to think that it's more about just giving advice about how you do your job. But I, I think that completely misses the cleverness of our author. He says, whoever digs a pit will fall into it and whoever breaks through a wall will get bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones will be hurt by them, and whoever splits logs will be endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not wet the edge, then more strength must be exerted, but wisdom helps one to succeed. And if the snake bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. <laughs> there is, I, I actually love this. This is very cool. Um, here we're looking at doing real stuff, real actions that require real commitment. First of all, it's digging a pit. Then another one's breaking through a wall, that's impressive. Then uh, quarrying stones, spilling logs. These are tasks you have to give yourself to and therefore involve high level risk. And this, this fully, Full involvement in doing real things means that you can be noticed. You can be seen doing your job. This clearly happened with Daniel in the book of Daniel where he, he's, he's, he's a stunning leader and everybody notices and is threatened by him. And so they therefore set him up um, to, to be executed. It's not because he's incompetent this happens. It happens because he's very competent. And in times of chaos, it is safer to be incompetent than competent. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, whoever digs a, 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 digs a big hole is going to fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall is going to just discover there's a snake to bite him. And, and if, you, if you quarry stones or split logs, you know, damage will happen in the task. I think he is saying that if, if you are in times of uncertain safety, you have to manage what you do carefully. And then it gets more specific in verse 10. If the iron is blunt and one does not work the edge, then more strength must be exerted. But wisdom will help one to succeed. Now, I always used to think that this was telling us to sharpen our axe, you know, um, and it kind of is that, if you really want to get the job done, have a sharp axe and you can chop down the tree. Because um, if the iron's blunt, it won't do the job. 
But I, I, I also think that this is saying something quite interesting. When you're chopping down a tree, you have to give your full self to the task. Um, and in it's, in it, it's kind of saying that we are kind of the ax, really. And we are swinging the ax. We're swinging, trying to do our job, and it's not cutting it. But its response then is um, wisdom helps one to succeed. And it, it's... I, I think that's really, really interesting. It, like if the X isn't cutting it and, and achieving the task for which it's, it should do, you have to give more strength. And the danger is in times of chaos that showing more strength is dangerous. And so therefore it says use wisdom instead. Now I'm, I'm not certain about my reading of that, but I think it's consistent with this flow that's going on because the last, Last one is verse 11, which says, if the snake bites before it's charmed, there's no advantage to, in, the, in a charmer. So we've already come across the snake in verse 8. If you, if you um, break through a wall, you'll get bitten by a snake. And one, um, Proven, Ian Proven, the uh, commentator, says he thinks this is about the king. That if you do something too, too good, the king will go after you. And that's what happened to David with Saul. The king goes after David because he's a threat, tries to kill him. And so if you break through a wall, you expect everybody to cheer, uh, but you get bitten by a snake. And likewise, what it's saying here, if you're going to do stuff, make sure the snake is charmed because it's too late to try and charm it once it's bitten. What... These interesting threads, I think, are telling us just the importance of wisdom to know what not to do. The wisdom to um, not excel when it's not safe to excel. To, so sometimes you have to manage being your full self. And you may be able to look back in work environments where you've realized, actually, I can't do my best work here. No, this is just not safe. So I, I think the response to folly is the wisdom to not excel. And that is um, curious wisdom to us because we all feel we should be able to excel. The second piece of um, ad advice comes from um, verse 12 to 20. And, it, and I'll, just, I'll just read it out. It says this. Um, it's one of one, the second warning about folly. Words spoken by the wise bring them favor, but the lips of fool cons fools consume them. The words of, of their mouths begin in foolishness, and their talk ends in wicked madness. Yet fools talk on and on. No one knows what is to happen. And who can tell anyone what the future holds? The toil of fools wears them out, for they don't even know the way to town. Alas for you, O land, when your king is a servant, and your prince's feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is a nobleman and the prince's feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in and through indolence the house leaks. The feast, uh, feasts are made for laughter, wine, wine gladdens life and money meets every need. Do not curse the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich, even in your bedroom, for the bird of the year will carry your voice and some winged creature Will tell the matter. Again, this emphasis on in times of foolishness and bad kingship, care is so needed. So I want to highlight a few things here, but probably the, the, the story of Rehoboam, um, Solomon's son, when he becomes king, informs this passage. He, he, he becomes king and he doesn't listen to the older men who's given wisdom about what to do. He listens to his mates who say, oh, you know, let's so say, you know, my, my dad kind of kind of beat you, but I'm going to scourge you with scorpions type stuff. To talk the big talk. And so he listens to these stupid young friends who, who, who shot their mouths off, and the kingdom splits in half. And his first decision, he listened to fools and the, and the big talk of fools. And here we're... Um, we, 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 we see the height of foolishness is talk, big talk. And the fool 
begins with himself and talks out. Well, he doesn't begin with the fear of God. He begins with himself and just talks what he thinks all the time. And so a center of gravity is just him or her. And there is no sense of Godwardness. And um, the second element which the wisdom literature highlights is fools just don't learn. They don't listen and they don't have a posture of learning and teachability. So he says, um, words of wise give favor, but the lips of fools consume them. Their mouths begin in foolishness and it ends in madness. They just talk, talk, talk to the point where they don't even know the way to town. <laughs> I, I quite like that. Um, so they get actually lost in their own reality, but it's not real. It doesn't help them navigate. It gets them lost. Even in environments where they should know where they're going. They just don't. I, I, th I think we see this kind of in so many uh, decision-making environments where people, to make things safe, they say we're going to target this behavior and they make the environments less safe. Um, so many of the, the movements so-called to, to deal with say, racism, sexism, and, and all sorts of stuff, um, all the talk and all the volatility that exists around that makes everything less safe and more horrific and make it more chaotic and everybody keeps their heads down. I, we, as, we as cultures that target behaviors and pass laws to deal with behaviors, I, I think the teacher of Ecclesiastes would say we, we, are, we, are, we have embraced, it full, embraced foolishness and, and he would go to say probably madness as well. We create mad environments where it's unsafe and you, you know you have to keep your head down, as the previous advice was. Don't do anything obvious, don't stand out. It's not safe to do so. So then he goes on to talking about um, last to you, Alain, when your, your king is a, is a servant. Now it's interesting, the word used for this is, is somebody who's not of full age. Uh, so it could be a child, translated as a child, but a servant or, and a child kind of had the same place in the society. So um, possibly the best word for this is who's king, when your king is immature. It's um, either way, there's somebody who hasn't got dignity and they allow decadence to take place. And so the, the prince is feast and they're drunk. Um, so if, is in a court is basically filled with people who are spending the cash rather than um, rather than investing in the country. Now, verse eighteen is, is is a key verse. It says, "Through sloth the, the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks." Um, we had a leaky roof a while ago, and the and the in, the, in a, a couple of the rafters rotted because I took so long to do something about it, such as my lack of skill and decisiveness in practical matters. And um, here it's basically saying in the process of feasting, the roof sinks in because the house leaks. This would seem to be an obvious thing, observing that your country is leaking, that it's collapsing. Um, the, the word for, for, it's not roof that is the actual um, Hebrew word, it's the beams or the rafters fallen. Um, and he's quite intentionally used that word rather than roof because it rhymes with another word he's been using all the way through, and that's the word fear. Um, it's, it's just an interesting thing that, that the roof sinks in, your fears sink in when there is poor leadership and anxiety increases. So it's a bit of a word play that we miss in English, but what, it, what he tends to say is that, you know, that the house collapses because the roofs give way, um, but our lives collapse as fear builds up and uh, it collapses what could have been good. And then it goes on to something that sounds like something that the writer of Ecclesiastes has said before, he says, feasts are made for laughter, wine gladdens the life, gladdens life, and money meets every need. And that cynical line tells us that he's not affirming this kind of life. 
Um, the literal reading in the Hebrew goes like this: For laughter, they for laughter they prepare food and wine, that brings joy to the living, and money meets the demands of both. So what it's saying is that money provides the food and wine that allows laughter. The goal is laughter, and we've seen early on in chapter two that laughter was equated to stupidity and madness, rather than true fellowship, which is more intimate. It's at the table, it's family, it's the wife of your youth. Here the end result these people are pursuing is laughter. You know, um, so, so much wealth is spent on the generation of laughter in terms of the upper kind of echelons. And you look, look at um, so much of the, the drug culture, the drinking culture, it is escape of reality. And it's, it's most extreme where the most wealth is. And here he's saying, you know, when he says money meets every need, it provides everything you need to, to achieve this goal of laughter. But that's diverting the very money that would have enabled the roof to be sound. And so this decadence destroys the kingdom. But then he says, and this is the beginning of some wise response is, but don't say anything because it's not safe. Don't even say in your bedroom criticism because it's going to be heard somehow. And uh, people lived in close quarters in those days, but I think it's more the principle here. Why would you speak out when immaturity and decadence and carnage is it creates an environment of chaos where it's not safe to be to be heard to be you, to be you and i i i think i think we have that same environment in the media in new zealand today and probably other places that they have no intention of reporting what you're saying they are pr promoting um an element that sensationalizes and can get you in trouble so here here it's a posture of carefulness again as in, in those um response but the last section um, is chapter 11 verse 1 1 to 6 send out your bread upon the waters for after many days you will get it back divide your means seven ways or even eight for you do not what know what disaster may happen on the earth when clouds are full they rain empty rain on the earth whether a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls there it will be and uh, whoever observes the wind will not sow, and whoever regards the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know how the breath comes to the bones in the mother's womb, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. But in the morning sow your seed, and at evening do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Some beautiful stuff here, but I think the writer of, of Ecclesiastes is saying when the short term is chaos, you have to think long term. You, you have to think the long game and know that some of what you do will fail. And not everything is going to turn out right. I think as the church faces its future in a, in, in a very difficult Western world, um, I think the decline of so many things is inevitable and we have to play a long game. We have to look in, and think in this chaos, this cultural chaos and disintegration, we're seeing everywhere families um, breaking, breaking down. If, if we do end up with a significant recession, a lot of things are going to break. Suicide is the warning signal that all is not right. Mental health is a warning signal that all is not right. In this world, we have to think long-term because it's very difficult to, to operate with a short-term mindset if we're going to see a change in a society that really is in, in some level of free fall. And tragically, this is unrecognized and our responses are to legalize marijuana or legalize this or that. Actually, are these any kind of solutions to the, the desperateness of mental health, the desperateness of our suicide rates that show a society without hope and meaning? 
So he says, send your bread out on the waters and after many days you'll get it back. This seems a height of stupidity to put bread on water and send it out, but he says that it'll come back. And I, I, it's more about, this is about trade, this is about enterprise, that quietly do your thing. There's nothing more subtle than just throwing some thin bread on the water and letting it go out and seeing what comes back. So he's not saying don't do business. What he's saying is do it quietly and just see how it goes. And then divide your means seven ways. So don't send out one boat, send out seven. Um, or, or even better, do something else somewhere else. And so that we're not relying for provision from just one thing. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, as our saying goes. It's, um, I, I've met so many people um, over the years who've had get-rich-quick schemes, tell, telling you how uh, you should join up with this or that to get the income that you've always wanted. And you see them years later, and they, their lives are no different. If anything, they're poorer. And it seems to me that this, this looking for the silver bullet, the financial thing that will f fix my life, and, and Lotto is the, the weekly celebration of just maybe this will fix things, putting my hope in one thing. And here we're being told, don't do that. Spread, spread, don't, don't put all your money there, for goodness sake. Um, you know, look, look to, to various options and have a whole lot of things going on. As a risk-averse person, uh, pretty my life is at its most varied now in the things that I do, and I'm really glad. It's really interesting. I, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but it's, it's this whole thing of uh, why narrow down to one thing? versatility is really important. And I think that's what we're being called to here. Because you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. So don't put all your money in the share market, okay? If it's booming, that's great, but it won't always boom. And you can put all your, your retirement in something else. And I've had parents' experience being ripped off by bad financial advice. Um, you know, so it's like spread your risk because you just don't know what's going to happen. And then it says, when the clouds are full, they empty rain on the earth. Now that's inevitable. Some, some things will inevitably happen and we can suss. But then a tree falling somewhere, that's random. We don't know which way it'll fall. North, south, east, west. We just don't know. So some, some things you can judge and some things you can't judge. But then it says, but if you keep observing the wind, whatever, you will not sow and you won't reap. So if you're looking for perfect conditions, everything to be all right, um, you'll never make decisions. In fact, you'll, you'll be a rabbit frozen in the headlights. You, you, you've, you've got to learn to trust God and your own, own instincts and what your heart says. And I meet so many people who've had dreams and schemes and, and things they would love to do, and they've never done them because uh, they looked to the wind and didn't sow. Um, I probably wish I'd done a whole lot of things earlier now that I've, I've gotten a bit over my fear of failure. But for many of us, our fear of failure, our fear of um, what other people will think means that we, we, we've never sown and so we'll never reap. So be brave. Don't just be kind, be brave. <laughs> then um, we don't know with how breath comes to the bones so we do not know the work of God who makes everything. And what it's giving us hope there, that often in the things that stir in our hearts, that we want to sow and we want to see reap, the breath of God is there. And why wouldn't you trust that God can do abundantly more than you can in your life and your situation? And so here he's bringing in this God dynamic, that the creative God can create with you and his breath can bring life to bones that would not otherwise live. And then, then the final advice after that God factor is brought in, the God who makes everything, he says, so sow your seed, and then the even don't let your hands be idle, i.e. do another job at night. Um, I haven't got there, I confess. I really chill out at night. In the evening, do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know what will prosper, this or that 
or whatever, or whether both of the like will be good. So he is saying, don't be lazy. Do these things, but vary, because in times of chaos and uncertainty, we don't know what's going to work, what's going to play out as, and, and succeed. Um, the comment about church, we really don't know the way ahead, and innovation is really hard to suss out. What do we do? We have to try things out. We, we actually have to trust God as we experiment and we learn about how to navigate this world. Um, what God has put, is, is going to allow us to succeed in. Um, but to think that um, we won't have to sow some seed that seems to be unfruitful, I think, is, is naive. The parable of the sower shows that only one lot of the sower's seed actually was successful but it was a hundredfold, you know? And likewise, we, we have to actually accept that some of our seed will fall on stony ground and we'll just think, oh, that was, that was a fail. But we've actually got to trust that the many things we do, um, the many innovations, and, and some of the innovations will come out of your heart, the things that you carry, the seed that you are meant to sow. So, and I really want to encourage you to take that seriously because we need more kingdom dreams. The absence of kingdom dreams is going to destroy uh, our few good God future. We need kingdom dreams, and they're not all going to be generated by the leader or the leadership. That's what this is all about. Let's, let's have the bravery to do seven or eight things, see if they all come off. God bless you.